Welcome to Calvary Chapel Jericho Road, Women's Study. We are traveling through the book of Exodus together. So will you pray with me? Father, I think about this label that you have put on us, holiness to the Lord. I think about all the labels you've put on we that belong to you, bride, treasure, beloved. And Lord, it's so hard to believe that you could see us as any of those things, but you've clearly declared that that's how you look upon us. That's who we are to you. Lord, then I think about labels that have been put on you when you hung on the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. When you will ride that white horse in last days and there will be a banner on your thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and you are truly those things. So Lord, help us to get a hold of what you are telling us when you Tell us that we are holy to you, and we are to walk in holiness, Lord. How we praise you for how you view us, how you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi. Last time we met, God had given the children of Israel what we know as the Ten Commandments. And the people, as you might remember, opted for an intercessor. They went back to their tents, and Moses went up the mountain to receive the rest of what God had to say to them. Ordinances that made them different from the people who did not belong to the Lord. That was a goal of the Lord's. I want you to look different than everyone else. And and what a sad moment that must have been for him when they decided they wanted the king. And remember, they said, we want to be like everybody else. And his heart, you know, is like, no, I want you to be different from the other nations. But he gave them ordinances that made them different from people who did not belong to him. And that was in Exodus 20. And in the chapters between the giving of the Ten Commandments and our lesson today, in chapter 28, God gave to Moses laws concerning topics like violence and ceremonial cleanliness and the Sabbath and offerings, the tabernacle and all that would go in it. Many, many things that would make his people different. Exodus 28 is mostly about the garments of the priesthood. Now, why did I choose that chapter? Why did we go from chapter 20 all the way to chapter 28? And I'll tell you why. I chose it because of the phrase in verse 36, holiness to the Lord. Words that the priests would wear on a turban that was set on their head. And now you might be thinking, okay, it was part of the priest's garment. That's what they were to wear when they were serving. But as we look at God's words regarding the priest's garments and God's expectation for his priests, it's important for us to see how God views you and me. We looked at this before we before when we studied God's reminder to the children of Israel of who they were to him before he gave them the law. And he said, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then we looked at how God makes believers today priests that this is not just about Israel in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you, we as believers, he calls us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, his own special people. Why? That we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then in Revelation 1, 6, speaking of what Jesus has made us, he's made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And right before that or right after that, I can't remember which verse it is, but it says, who has washed us in his own blood. How precious we are. He has washed us, and then he says, you're priests, you're kings. When Jesus hung on the cross and declared it is finished, remember the veil was torn from the top 
to the bottom. Before that, see, only priests, only the high priest could enter certain, that certain part of the temple. And in that moment when Jesus said, it is finished, when the veil was torn, everything changed. He had made that payment that you and I couldn't pay for all the wrongs we've done. Jesus had obtained access to the very throne of God for us, direct access to him for all those that came to him through Jesus. So when you and I made Jesus Savior, we were not only saved, but we became priests. And of course, so much more. So I want to go with this lesson keeping in mind that although the direct application is regarding the garments of Aaron, the high priest, and then the garments of all the priests of all time, at that time, uh, there are some very important similarities for you and me to apply in our own lives. Much of how the Lord viewed the priests, he views you and he views me as believers. So may we not only... Uh, sense the honor and the privileges we have because God calls us priests, but also better understand the responsibilities that are attached to those privileges for us. Let's first look at the the text. Look at verse 1. If you don't have your Bibles open to chapter 28 of Exodus, you might benefit from doing that. I'll put everything else on the screen. Now, take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Now, the role of the priest here we see is to minister to the Lord and then to minister to the people. They could not, and we cannot, minister to the people until we have first ministered to the Lord. Remember, we can't do God things without God's power. And since that's a priest's responsibility to minister to the Lord, I think it's important that we know, what is it? What, how do you minister to God? I mean, you know what the word minister means? It means to attend to or take care of the needs of someone. Now, apply that to us and the Lord. What can we do to attend to God's needs? He needs nothing. Think about that. God desires that we love him and obey him, but there's just nothing you and I can do to take care of God's needs. I love his name, Jehovah, the self-existent God, the one who needs nothing, and yet the becoming one, the one that becomes all you and I need. That's our God. So the definition, the biblical definition of minister here was different than what I expected. The phrase minister to me as priest is really just one Hebrew word, kahan. The literal sense is this, you shall act like a priest. That's what it means to minister to him. Act like a priest. I don't know, that that helps me. You and I are called to act like what and who God has called us to be. If we do, we will minister to him and minister to others. It's translated, the, the word, what is that word? Um, kahan is translated in Isaiah 61.10, and it looks a little bit different. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, and he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. See the word minister there? See the word kahan? What word there might have been translated that? It's decks. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. Maybe it's best understood as as a bridegroom dresses for his wedding or puts on the clothes that the bridegroom wears. You know, and so the priest puts on his godly, these garments, these holy garments, and you look at him, and what do you say? That's the priest. When you look at a bridegroom, you go to a wedding, how hard is it to find the bride? You know, there's the bride. There's the bridegroom. Why? Because they're dressed according to the role that they are walking in. And so this 
as it's talked about the bridegroom decking himself, that's what we do as priests. We deck ourselves. We look like, act like what God has called us to be. They should be able to look at us and the way we look and the way we act and say, she's a Christian because a good thing, because of how they see us. So in verse 2, God told Moses, you shall make holy garments for Aaron. And I'm so glad there's a verse 3 here. And we'll talk about verse 3 much more next week as we look at God's instructions for the tabernacle. But God gave Moses some pretty complicated instructions, as you will read for next week. And if I were Moses, and if God stopped at verse 2, I would have felt a ton of pressure. You shall make, and then the description that follows that. I mean, Moses was well aware of the fact that God had called him to do things way beyond his ability. Moses argued with God at the burning bush, and it was to no avail. But because Moses did obey, Moses got to see God use him and equip him in ways that he never imagined. Now on Mount Sinai, the Lord tells Moses, you shall make holy garments. See, not only just garments, but you shall make holy garments, Moses. I mean, most of you know how creative I am not. And if I were sitting on Sinai and the Lord said to me, Kathy, you shall make holy garments. I, I think I, I wouldn't have cared about what he did at the burning bush. I would have said, well, I can lead people, Lord. I, you know, I didn't think I could do that, but I can do that. But I can't make holy garments. You know, I, I just can't. I wonder if God paused between his statement in verse 2 and his statement in verse 3. We don't know, but I, I think I would have because I like to see people squirm sometimes. You know, I, leaders know it. You know, I, I give you a responsibility, and then I, I watch your faces. You know, and because I know what God's going to do. I know God's going to equip you, but we have that panicky feeling for just a little bit. So I don't know if God waited for a moment and said, Moses, you shall make holy garments for the priests, or if we went right into verse 3. God could have equipped Moses to make the holy garments. Certainly that was no more difficult than using Moses as his instrument to perform all the miracles of the plagues or the crossing of the Red Sea or the provision of water or manna or just leading two million people through the wilderness. But God didn't do that. It wasn't Moses' show. Verse 3 tells us that the Lord said to Moses, so you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. We will see next week that God not only filled them with wisdom, but he filled them with understanding and knowledge. And then in all manner of workmanship, God gifted them. He equipped them to do what he was calling them to do. What difference do you think, I asked this question in the homework, what difference do you think it would make if an artisan used God's gifting and wisdom to make garments instead of his own wisdom and experience? Our first answer typically is, well, it'd be just like God wanted it, which is true. But the other thing is, is we tend to think, well, it would be so much more beautiful if we did it the way God wanted to. But sometimes that's not true. And sometimes creative people, they're like, this is what would be so beautiful. And God goes, no, no, I, I don't want it that way. And so it's, it's very hard for all of us, even in ministering to a person, we get the idea of this is how this person needs to minister to. This is the best way. And God comes along and says, no, it's not my way. So anytime we step into doing God's things, we know he equips us and we've got to watch for that equipping because his intentions, his designs are so different from ours. But it's very interesting that he starts out with saying, Moses, you shall make. Because Moses was responsible for how those garments turned out. 
he was responsible to tell the artisans, relay to the artisans, this is what God has told me, how they're supposed to look. Then the artisans had to respect what Moses said. And Moses was ultimately the one responsible to the Lord. Verse 2 tells us the garments were to be made for glory and beauty. God used those words again in verse 40. Beauty is also translated as honor. So we, we can see in Deuteronomy 26, 19, that he will set you high above all nations, which he has made in praise and name and in honor, that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. These garments of the priests were to reflect the weight, as we've been talking about, and the honor of the position, a position they had, not because they earned it, but simply because God gave it to them. And, and there was a question in the homework about uh, honoring positions, and we've talked a little bit about that during um, our time this year and, and other times of honoring husbands and honoring parents and honoring those in authority. But here there's a sense of not only honoring the priest, but as priests, we honor our position. You know, God gives us a position, and we are to honor who he has called us to be. Just like all the incredible things God calls us as believers, uh, they're titles that we haven't earned. Can you imagine? I'm a treasure, because you know what I did? That's why God calls me a treasure. You know, not going to happen. We have titles, glorious titles, because we are his, and we're to represent him as such. So the wearing of the garments depicted the fact that the priests were consecrated to the Lord. And consecrate means set apart, holy. In other words, just as the Lord says about you and me, he says about the priest, they are mine. And these garments were to give the priest the, um, the position, not the men themselves, but the position of priest, glory or dignity, beauty, honor. They were to note them as set apart, just as a uniform identifies a soldier or a nurse. So I want to quickly look at the pieces of the garment, or we would say maybe the priest's uniform. Uh, and as I thought about that, it made me think of the, the Marine dress uniform. So I pulled up a, a couple pictures. And I love this because see what it says here? If you want it work for it. And, and, you know, God doesn't do that. You want my grace? Work for it. You want my favor? Work for it. You know, you want to wear what the priests wear? You want my robe of righteousness? Work for it. No. That's what the world says, but it's not what our God says. And then you see, every piece of his uniform is a reward. It marks something that he has done well. And every piece of that uniform has a purpose with the priesthood, with you, and with me. Everything on our garment has been placed on us as symbolic of who God has called us. Every part of the priest's garment was important as it represented something very important. Each had a specific significance. When I was in elementary school for two different years, I, we, they would let us out of school for an hour at a time to go to Christian release time education. We memorized a lot. And when you first came, started going to Christian release time education, we had to memorize five things. And once you memorized five things, you got a beanie. So I had to memorize the Bible salute, the Christian flag salute, the doxology. I think this one has five, this one has four. This must have been my first year. The American flag salute. On this one, we were supposed to memorize how God loved us in Titus 2.13, and it says, I sinned, Romans 3.23. And so when we did that, we got our beanie, and we could wear our beanie. 
And then we would get, you know, as we went through the year, we would memorize other verses. And for every verse that we memorized, we would get a little felt thing. And this says sin and the inspired word. And we memorized, I memorized every book of the New Testament, every book of the Old Testament. And I wore this beanie because it said so much about me. But what is this beanie? Every single thing on this beanie is a reward, isn't it? I earned every one of these verses that I memorized. And I think the main effect of my beanies was what? Pride. Look at me. I could go to the group, and you know what? I'm obsessed with doing well, and so I could go to my little group and put my beanie on and just, I got more pieces of felt on than anybody else in this little class. Look at me. See my beanie? What do you think I thought of that? You know, just pride. See, that was not God's intent for the holy garments he designed for the priests. His intent was that when they were worn, both the people and the priests were to honor what they represented. So in verse 4, we see the breastplate. The breastplate had on it 12 stones, one stone for representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The breastplate was attached at the shoulders, there's the stones at the shoulders, uh, with two chains. And on the chains were two stones. And on each, on one stone was the engraved the six tribes of Israel. On the other stone, the other six tribes. So as the priest entered into the Holy of Holies, he was always to be reminded that you are serving the people. You know, the, the people right there on his shoulders. Don't forget to be about the people as you come before the Lord. And then in the, uh, the breastplate, uh, it was, it was folded because it made a pocket. And so in that was um, two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, which we know very little about, but we know that somehow they were used for the priest to consult the will of God. Best guess is they were kind of like one's yes, one's no. So they would be inside the pocket. Some guesses are one was black, one was white. Some way you would know the difference between them. People would come to the priest, the priest would consult of God, what would you have them do, yes, no, and he'd reach in, pull out one of the rocks, and the white would give one answer, and if he pulled out a black, that would be another. And so that was inside. The breastplate was attached, attached to the ephod, so that's that, that kind of vest-looking thing that it is attached to. So very often the breastplate and the ephod are referred to one thing because they are attached together. Numbers, oh, I'm just going to read it to you. Numbers 27, 21. He shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim. At, this, at his word they shall go out. At his word they shall come in. He, is all, he, ha, he and all the children of Israel with him all the congregation. So sometimes they'd go to the priest and say, should we go to war or not? Reach in there? Yes or no. That was a means that they used uh, through really the time of the judges, and we don't hear about it again. And then there was the... Wait a second, I'm off a little bit here. Okay, we did the vest, the robe. Uh, it was to be made of all blue. And see, this is where you have creativity might kick in. You know, if you're an artisan and you make the robe, it has to be all blue. Oh, well, just a, a pretty thread kind of running through it, maybe purple, that's royalty. You know, maybe put something like that through there. You know, you would just have to fight those kind of tendencies, and Moses would have to say, no, it's got to be all blue. And this was very important. It was to be seamless, with no tear for the head opening. 
You know who wore a robe like that? Remember when they threw dice for, for Jesus' garment? He had a robe that was seamless because he's our priest. John thought that was important. John pointed that out. So see how important? What if someone had said, you know, it would be a lot easier to just sew a little seam up the back? No big deal. Mess up God's whole plan. Got to do it God's way. And on the hymn um, of the robe, they did get to be a little creative. And they were to put pomegranates and um, bells made of gold. But it was supposed to be pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, bell. All the way around. Important. That's how God wanted it. If the priests were to go into the Holy of Holies at one time a year and commit some sort of sin and uh, he died, the bells would stop ringing. Tradition says then they would be prepared to pull the priest out. And it was also to remind them of just the solemn nature of their work. And then they had this skillfully Oops, one more. Skillfully woven tunic. Now, now you can barely see it. You know, we, we might think, well, that's just under everything else. Maybe it's not important. And yet God specifically says it's got to be skillfully woven. Everything was important, whether it was visible or not. Then the turban. It was a wound uh, piece of linen, but the, the linen was supposed to be um, eight yards of material, so 24 feet of linen wrapped around to make this turban. He would be very aware of a turban being on his head, thinking it would be pretty heavy. Notice the priests, they are decked out in beautiful garments, yet look at their feet. They're bare. Why is that? God specifically did not have them design any shoes. Could have been beautiful, ornate shoes. Remember when God called Moses to the burning bush? He told him to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. There was nothing special about the ground. It was chemically the same as all, all the ground that was around it. Just dirt, probably sandy dirt. But God called it holy. You're standing on holy ground. Why? What made that dirt holy? Because God was about to do something holy on it. The bare feet of the priest recognized that also as they entered before God's presence. See, we're not holy. We've been set apart to do holy things. And bare feet symbolize humility not holiness. Bare feet symbolizes our attitude that we are to have regarding being holy, be, regarding being holy, separated to the Lord, that we're available to his work and his holiness. And I thought about, you know, some of you have seen me after church on Sundays, and one of the first things I do is I, I take off my shoes. Well, just so you know, that is not an expression of my holiness or trying to look humble. I just hate shoes, and I love bare feet, so just to clarify that. But these priests, as they wore this garment, specifically bare feet. Now notice, God specifically gave certain designs, rules about making the garments the breastplate was attached so that it was very straight. Chains, the exact same length, hooked onto the top of the ephod. You would not see a priest ever with a cockeyed breastplate. Sloppy. God designed it to make sure it was straight. Pomegranates and bells in order creative person might say, well, let's do a pomegranate bell, then two pomegranates, and two bells, and you know, and God says, no, one after another.
You wanted things for glory and beauty, and we need to do God's things God's way. The priests wore things that reminded them that they were to be about the people, and they were not to take their role lightly or sloppily. In Leviticus, it's told when they laid the, the wood on the altar, it says it was, was to be laid in order. See, that was important to God. I don't know why, but it was. It wasn't like we would think, well, just throw the wood on the altar. It's going to burn. God says lay it in order. So order was important to him and still is. When they gave each of the tribes their position, when they settled in Sinai for those 11, 12 months, I would have just said, it, you know, God said, I want them around the tabernacle. I would have said, hey, get your tribes together, set your tents, park somewhere around the tabernacle. But if you do an aerial view, oops, the sash also kept the, uh, the ephod tied well. Okay. I want to go to something else first. Okay. Here, if we do the aerial view, this is what it looked like. God specifically said, this is how the tribes are supposed to be set up. Now, a lot of people say, okay, what do you see? We see a cross. I don't know. But so many people say, that's significant. You could have it had those tribes set up in so many different ways, but that is what God chose. Okay, let's go back to our guy. All right. And then... The plate on the turban this is the part that I think is most important, at least how it relates to you and to me. Look at verse 36 in chapter 28. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. It might surprise us, but God's desire for his people is not to make us happy. It's to make us holy. Therefore, our true satisfaction comes when we're pursuing what God has chosen for us, holiness, not happiness. Look at how uh, we're described in 1 Peter 2.5. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. We're living stones. We're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. First step towards happiness is holiness. If we're right with the Lord, then we can start being right with others. And then we can start being right in the circumstances of our lives. If we aim at happiness, we miss it. But if we aim at holiness, we will find his kind of happiness, the best kind of joy, a joy in spite of whatever we are facing Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. These words are a part of a message given by Jesus that we call the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon ends saying this, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. This sermon was like no one, no sermon that had ever been preached or has been. This verse is among those we, we call the Beatitudes. And now I've heard the word Beatitudes uh, explained as Beatitudes, the attitudes we should be or have. True. But the meaning is the word blessed. Jesus was teaching on the way to have a life of blessing, blessing as God intended. Now, if that sermon were titled, How to Be Happy, bestseller, you know, especially in these days now. Yet all too often we look at the words of this ser sermon and we write them off. But do we write them off because we see them as impossible, which is one of Jesus' points, but the other is, are we not really interested in, in the results? See, take, for example, the very first one. Blessed are the pure in heart. Well, the result of purity of heart is we see God. Would we rather say blessed are the pure in heart because they shall be satisfied? They shall get what they want? 
Just what does Jesus mean when he speaks of being pure in heart? A, a pure heart is a heart that is not mixed. Years ago, when a statue or a vase uh, had a flaw or a crack in it, what they would do is take wax and kind of get it in the crack and cover the crack. And, uh, but then when they would sell a vase that did not have that, it would say, without wax, pure. What do, we, what do we discover when we have a heart that's not mixed with other motives? We see God. We experience him in a deeper way. See, how badly do you and I want that? Jesus' sermon was more like how to be holy than how to be happy. And we're challenged. Are we interested in that? Because if we're not interested in holiness or interested in seeing God and experiencing God, why do we want a pure heart? I looked up the use of the word holy in the Bible as it does not refer to God as it refers to us and other things. And it made me feel better because sometimes when we think we're holy, we, we feel all this pressure. But the ground is holy. Clothing can be holy. Offerings or gifts can be holy. Oil, holy. Places, land, mountains. Utensils in the temple are called holy. Things that are pretty unimpressive, they're all holy. Why are they holy? Simply and only because they have been set apart for God's purposes. We look at those things and our response should be that belongs to God. We have another privilege as priests in Leviticus 21.10. It says, he that is the high priest among his brethren on whom his head is the anointing was the anointing excuse me on whose head the anointing oil was poured and who is consecrated to wear the garments shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes why because in those days uncovering the head and tearing the clothes was a sign of despair of losing hope that's what the people did when they were in so despair, they were so hopeless, they would just take whatever hat they had on and they would just tear their robes. Like, there's no hope in this one. This one is horrible. I'm going down in this. And what does God say? The priest doesn't get to do that. Why? Because he had access to the throne of God. Anyone with access to the throne of God never has to feel despair, fear, scared. Disappointment, yes, but never despair. And so he says that same thing to us. Don't, you don't ever have to feel despair. Don't tear your robes. Don't do anything that shows anyone else that, that you've given up. Because we don't get to do that as Christians. Because we need to be telling people that our God is holy and he will take care of us. And we are never hopeless. Sin sets us apart for, from God's purposes Holiness sets us apart for God's purposes. So the moment you and I set ourselves apart for God's purposes, we're walking in holiness. Remember, I've, I've talked to you before about why does God love us? Just because. And he says in Deuteronomy 7, 6, you're a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a holy people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. And then Moses goes on and says, remember, God didn't choose you because you're a great nation. You're a stubborn people. God chose you because he chose you. God loves you because he loves you. God calls you holy because you're his. It's as simple as that. But our enjoyment, see, our enjoyment of this setting apart is only possible when we walk in it. This turban that the high priest was to wear with the gold plate engraved, holiness to the Lord. The high priest was the one who would represent God to the people. Now we as believers, we represent God to others. Whether we want to or not, we have no choice. If we do it poorly, we are still representing the Lord to others. And, and sometimes, don't you want to say, don't, don't look at me. 
You know, look at Jesus. But the fact is, they, they do look at us. But we get to choose whether we will walk in holiness or not. The inscription on the turban said, holiness unto the Lord. Like it or not, you're wearing that hat. God's put it on you. <laughs> the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit came in. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I think we got this invisible hat, holiness to the Lord. And sometimes we go, I don't, I don't want to wear the hat. Well, he put it on you. When I teach pastor's wives, I, I tell them, you have a hat on you that says pastor's wife. And I know you didn't, a lot of you didn't sign up for it. You became a pastor's wife. Why? When your husband said, I'm going to be a pastor. And so many pastor's wives tell me, I don't want to wear the pastor's wife hat. Um, well, you know, it's on you. You got to wear it. And for us as Christians, we have this holiness to the Lord. He's put it on us. May we walk in it in a way that honors him. Our holiness is simply and only because we choose to live our lives separated to be used by the one who is holy. When we live lives that reflect our love for him and we speak of the fact that his name is good, see, that's holiness on our part. You've heard the statement, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Many of us were drawn by that statement, and many of us get duped into thinking that God's wonderful plan for our life coincides just with our plan for our life. And as we walk with the Lord for a while, we find that those two things collide. As I was studying for this, I read the definition of holiness that struck me. It's a secular definition. And it says, that which is not secular is holy. Not relating to worldly or temporal it describes something that is elevated out of the sphere of what is ordinary. I love that. He calls us holy. He has elevated us out of the sphere that is ordinary. Take, for example, the instruments used in the temple. The priest would take a shovel and spread the ashes around on the altar. God called that shovel holy. What if someone came up to you and, and while you're holding the shovel, you're one of the priests, and said, Hey, there's some trash over there. Can you help pick that up? Go take that shovel and pick up the trash? Well, what you're would supposed to, you're supposed to say is, no, 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 this shovel's holy. God intended this shovel to only rake these ashes around. I know, I know the shovel can do that. The shovel can pick up trash, but that's not what God called it to do. And see, when he calls us holy and he calls us bo our bodies separated to him, our bodies can do a lot. We all know that. A lot of things, uh, temptations come our way. And, and what God is calling us to say is, no, I'm holy. God has called me not to do that. He's called me to walk in holiness. He has a purpose for my body. My body belongs to God. When our granddaughter Zoe was about three years old, our, our family went down to the beach, the cliffs, and at one point she's gone closer and closer, and she's standing pretty close to the edge of the cliff. Well, grandmas are very, very protective, and uh, as she got way too close for me, I said to her, Zoe, come back here, be careful, you could fall. And her response to me was, no, mommy will catch me. And sometimes we have that idea about sin, isn't it? No, you better not do that. It'll take you down. No, God will catch me. There's grace. I'm not going to worry about it. And her mom would have tried to catch her. Holiness is knowing that standing at the edge of the cliff is a scary place to be. I, yesterday, um, I was riding with some other pastor's wives to a board meeting. I was sitting in the back seat with one, and we were talking about the old Jesus days. And um, she said, you know, I, d I did the whole drug scene. And she goes, when I first got saved, I was so excited about the Lord, but I didn't know what to do on Friday night. So I still went down to Huntington Beach where everybody partied. And sitting down on Huntington Beach, and somebody hands me a joint. You know, and I, I looked at it and handed it back. And the guy's like, what's wrong with you? 
you know? And she said, it wasn't so much that it was wrong, that, but it was, I didn't want to lose what I had with Jesus, you know, because I found that Jesus is so much better. I was like, I don't want that. And she started recognizing her holiness, how God had set her apart for himself, for good stuff, and she didn't want anything that drug her down. See, do you tend, what about you? Do you tend to like the edge? Or do you like being in the center of God's will, away from the cliff? Sin's a, a tricky thing. It's deceitful. It says to us things like, just a little bit, just one time, you're still in control. All of those statements or thoughts are meant to just pull us a little closer to the edge of the cliff. But somehow and at some time, the little bits become more. The just one times become frequent. And that which we thought we had a handle on has suddenly got a handle on us. And there's no real warning. You know, we, we wish God would have these lights blaring, getting close, getting close, you know. We'd probably ignore them anyway, but, but he doesn't do that. He, there's, there's not a, a place in time where, where we get that sense of this is far enough. We don't see it as we should. James tells us that when we sin, we deceive ourselves. So we go, look, go a little closer to the edge, thinking we still have allowed that safe distance from really falling. And I've shared before, I, I really think there's this vacuum right on the edge. And, and it's on kind of low power when we start step, stepping into sin, and it just kind of pulls us a little bit, and we don't even see it. And then we get within this range, and we're never told where it is, where the enemy kind of flips a vacuum onto high power, and, it's, and we go, how did that happen? I thought I was doing fine. And he's got us. And so we, we've got to want be, to be in the center of the edge, uh, the center of God's will. But I was thinking as I went home uh, this afternoon, I, I was thinking, but you know when the enemy's got us like this? And it seems so very powerful. Holy Spirit knows how to just get in between and pull us apart. He's stronger. He's always stronger. My challenge to you is a lot like my challenge was to my granddaughter. What's so great about the edge? What's so great about falling? Look at this photo of Zoe when we were in Israel. Where did her mom put her? Right in the center of that rock. Because her mom loves her and knows that, you know, as exciting as kind of being at the edge of the rock might have been for Zoe, you know, the safe place, the place where she could really enjoy things was right in the center. And, and God says, I want you in the center of my will. And sometimes we think, well, a vacuum is over here. You know, how far can I go? till I can get sucked in. And it's like, why, why do we want to be over here? God says being in the center of my will is the best place to be. In Zechariah 3, 4, and 5, God talks about the turban. And he talks about the priest, and he says, take away the filthy garments from him and let them put on a clean turban on his head. And my sweet husband this afternoon, he watched this morning's message, and he said, I knew you when you wore the beanie. I knew you when you were prideful. And he goes, and I know you now belonging to the Lord and wearing that turban. And he goes, you know, the Lord comes to us, and he says to us, I want to trade your hat, you know. And what a glorious thing that is. You know, and he, he just, it was so sweet of him. He goes, he just, the Lord traded hats on you. It's like, yeah, he did. He did. There's a little short-tailed weasel called an ermine. He looks like this. He has this unique feature that in the wintertime, his fur turns white. Very, very white, as you can see. Here's another shot of him. He's really a cutie. He instinctively protects his white coat against anything that will soil it. You know, his purity is so important. He's just, I'm not getting this dirty. I want to be white. 
So hunters take advantage of this. They don't set a snare or a trap to catch him. Instead, they find out where the ermine lives, which is usually a cleft in a rock or a hollow in an old tree. And they smear the entrance or the interior with this grimy, gooey, black stuff. And then the hunters set their dogs out to find and chase the ermine. And the frightened ermine responds by running to his home, that place that is supposed to be the good place, the safe place. But as he gets to his home, he, he stops abruptly because he sees what had been done to his home, and he knows if he enters that home, his white coat is not going to be white anymore. For the ermine, purity is more precious than life. Purity is more precious than safety. It's a challenge to us. Is, is holiness more important than happiness? More important than safety or security? Sure, the ermine had, would rather have gone into his home and been safe, but to compromise his purity, his holiness, for his happiness was simply not an option for the ermine. And I want to be like that. You know, when I'm given options, holiness or this, I want to be like that ermine and say, I don't care what it costs, I want holiness. Jacob had been a pretty rebellious, oh, got to show you this because it took a long time when I first did it. That's what we want to be like. You know, we want to be white like this ermine and, and put that turban on and holiness to the Lord. That should be us. So now, Jacob, rebellious guy. Right up to the night that he wrestled with God. And then everything changed for Jacob and his response in Genesis 32:30. He called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now, Peniel means facing God. And as I typed that, I saw another concept of holiness. It's facing God. Jacob changed because he saw God, because he faced God. Holiness is facing God. Holiness is just turning to the direction of where God is pressing towards him. See, holiness isn't perfection. We will not achieve perfection until we stand before Jesus in heaven. It's choosing who or what we will face, what we turn our hearts towards, facing the only one who is holy. The high priest had the privilege of going to the holy of holies, which represented the very throne of God. That's where holy people go. You may have seen those necklaces that a heart is in two different pieces and, you know, you keep one and you give another one to someone that is very, very special to you. Putting them together, it, it makes that one heart. God has engraved upon us holiness unto the Lord. Israel at one time, or many times really, they were at a place of doubting God's love and purpose for them. And so they said in Isaiah 49, 14, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. And our Lord countered their thinking with these words, his response, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget Yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The Lord has on his hand an inscription of you. And you have on your head an inscription from him. That is so very sweet and special. We just celebrated Mother's Day. Motherhood is not the greatest, most fulfilling hat we can wear. Nor is the hat that says wife. The greatest, the most greatest, most fulfilling hat you and I can wear is holiness to the Lord. That's the one 
that we want to wear, and we want to wear well. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for all the names you call us. Thank you for seeing us as precious. Thank you for wanting us, Lord, that, that you call us to yourself, that you want us for yourself. What a great, wonderful God you are. Would you place in each one of us a deeper appreciation of being called holy for you? May we be decked in holiness, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name.
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on. talking about how holiness is, is facing God. And I, I think about that song, a holiness is facing holiness. Um, when we praise him, when we acknowledge him for who he is, we want to be holy. Um, I was thinking about not facing him. Can you imagine, you know, turning your back on the Lord, which is what we do when we sin, and, and trying to be holy? It's just not going to happen. And so it's very important for us when we, and there's so many times, I don't feel holy. We never feel holy. And it's like, face holiness. Just face holiness. When we, when we have, I don't have a desire to be holy. Face holiness. And watch how it changes us. Enjoy your groups, girls. <laughs> 